Well, you've, you've been a good audience. Uh, I could be uh, straining the point now at about 2.30, but uh, hopefully you've all got a cup of coffee and we can uh, go for another uh, 45 minutes. We'll talk about preserving unity. I understand that the word unity has a bit of a supercharged meaning up here than it, it might back in California. So uh, let me make sure the microphone is on when I tell you that uh, well, I'm not talking about that kind of unity. I'm not talking about inter-ecclesia unity. Uh, we're going to talk, talk specifically about the unity in your own home ecclesia. Now, you might, on your own, apply some of these lessons to the, the, the larger issue when you're dealing with other ecclesias, but that's not my, uh, my point today. Because unity begins at home, begins at your home ecclesia. So I want to specifically address the relationships that you maintain in your home ecclesia. Because life is all about learning how to love each other. That's why we're here, that's why we're put together in ecclesias, that's why ecclesias exist. Is because God wants us to learn how to love others. The, the verse that's really convicted me over the years is one of the verses we read this morning in our first class. It's uh, Matthew 25, verse 40. I tell you the truth, whatever you did to the, for the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did to me. It's not about uh, what you do for your brothers and sisters. It's about what you do for the ones that you don't really like that very much. That's really what it's about. What, what did Christ mean when he said the least of one of these? He wasn't talking about the short ones, you know, the ones who haven't been baptized very long. You know, he's talking about the ones that you hold least in stature, the ones that are least in importance to you. Let's face it, not everyone in your meeting is a uh, great you. And, and, you know, when you, when, you, when you look out on a Sunday morning, you know, there's that, you know, weird Uncle Al. And, uh, and y y you know, you, uh, it's all about how you treat him. It's not about... <laughs> it's, it's not about how you treat the ones that you like. So ecclesial relations, your ecclesial life is not about just the relationships that come easily. There's a, you have a certain cultural affinity to some people. You know, you meet them for the first time and, and you just, you, you get along. You, you see life similar. You're in similar positions, maybe with your family, your, with your ages of your children or socioeconomical uh, connections. And you get along great. And that's good. That's, that's healthy. That's correct. We get, we get encouraged and, and reinforced by those kind of relationships where you don't have to try. It's, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take any effort. You know, where you can take your shoes off even though you know your socks smell because that person is, you know, he's your brother and he loves you and it's okay. But we learn the most from the relationships that don't come easily. We, we learn the most about how to love from relationships where there's not that natural affinity. We learn the most from these prickly, kind of uncomfortable relationships. Relationships with a brother or sister that's not that easy to get along with. Relationships that are hard to maintain. It's in these relationships that we truly learn how to love. In other relationships, we're just experiencing love. We're just enjoying love. By actually learning how to love. Actually having to exercise yourself. And, and try and work at it. These relationships also tend to be quite volatile. And they can fall apart quite easily. So part of what God wants for us to learn is how to reconcile relationships. That's what we're going to talk about. Preserving unity. How to build back together relationships that fall apart. He's actually given this to do as a job. 2 Corinthians 5 says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's our job. It's part of our, of our role, our ministry, is to be to, to reconcile things. So sometimes when a relationship falls apart, whether there's a rift, a hurt, or a conflict, you can't just ignore it. Don't just say to yourself, well, that's their problem, and, and move on. What, what do you do? If you shouldn't ignore it, what do you do? I think you have to commit yourselves to reconciliation with your brothers and sisters, because relationships are worth restoring. 
Romans 15 says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. It's your job. So if we're to be known for our love for one another, then broken fellowship is a disgraceful testimony to us. If people are to know us because of how we love each other, then if, if we're not getting along, if we've got a, if we've got a rift, that's, that's a disgrace. We need to be peacemakers. We all need to learn to be peacemakers. Peacemaking is not avoiding conflict. We talked earlier today. If you're going to have honest and authentic relationships, you have to lovingly speak the truth. Don't avoid con- conflict. Don't brush things under the, under the rug. Don't ignore them. If there's something going on, it's going to make an awkward hour or an awkward day or maybe an awkward month. A little blip in our relationship, but our relationship will come out of it stronger and better if we talk about this. You've all experienced this with your husband and your wife. You all kind of know what that is. Uh, you know, that bad breath. You know, and it's a simple fix. All you got to do is brush your teeth. Uh, you know, I'm not just going to ignore this for the next 40 years, right? Let's just talk about it. Honey, uh, every time you eat onions, it really reacts strong with you. Would you mind brushing your teeth afterwards, you know? Okay. Although she loves Greek food, it's, uh, you know, it's an issue. I'm not talking about me personally. No, I would never do that, would I, Kelly? Uh, so pretending a problem doesn't exist or, or being afraid to talk about it, that's not peacemaking. That's just ignoring Peacemaking is not appeasement. It's not, it's not giving in. You know, being a doormat. If you do that, you're eventually going to feel hostility for the person. I, I'm, I'm a big person. I can give in. I can, I can uh, lay down. I can be a doormat. Twice. Maybe, maybe twice. That's about it. You know, by the third time, I'm done with you. and I'm mad. You know? that's, that, that's not going to build any kind of unity in the ecclesia. Peacemakers are, are people who are full of grace. They draw continually on the goodness of God. Then they bring His love and His mercy and His forgiveness, His strength and His wisdom to the conflicts of their daily life. Peacemakers dissipate anger. They improve understanding. They promote justice and they encourage repentance. And peacemakers focus on resolution. That's what they want to get through our heads today. Focus on resolution. If fellowship is broken, it needs to be restored. Here's seven biblical steps to restoring fellowship. First one, talk to God before you talk to the person. Get down on your knees and pray about the conflict. Instead of gossiping about it, pray about it. What's amazing is we're going to find out right here in step number one, most of it goes away. God often just resolves the problem Himself if you ask Him, if you pray about it. God can change your heart, so all of a sudden it just doesn't bother you anymore. Or God can change the other person's heart, so they change, just because you ask. If you have to approach the person, pray to God first. Ask God to give you guidance, to give you courage, to actually approach Him, to bring it up, to talk about what needs to be talked about. And guidance to to say the right thing. Encourage to actually say it. So pray beforehand. Secondly, always take the initiative. You. It's your job. It's your responsibility. You're the one who's given the ministry of reconciliation. It's your job to go say something, to go do something, to address this issue. It doesn't matter if you were the one offended or you were the one doing the offending. God expects you to make the first move. Don't wait for them to make the first move, even though they should, because we know they should. They're the ones that did it. They should come talk to me. Doesn't matter. Matthew 5, verse uh, 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember, your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer the gift. Translate this 2,000 years later. Therefore, if you're driving the memorial service, and you realize that you've got something against your brother... Don't go to memorial service. Turn around, drive back, and go and reconcile. That's what it's saying. It's saying, get this thing done. It's important. Do it before Sunday. Don't let it fester. Don't let it get worse. 
Schedule a face-to-face -face meeting with the person as soon as possible. Not on the phone. Not by an email. Not by letter. Don't send them a text. Right? Schedule a face-to-face -face meeting. And, and take some time. Choose the right place. Choose the right time. Probably not after memorial service on Sunday. You know, they're just finishing out the, the closing hymn. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Really? That's probably not the best place for us to talk about this. Uh, uh, timing is important too. Do it when you're fresh. Do it when you're both uh, able to give it the time. That there's not kids running around. They're able to give it some attention. Uh, if you both go to work, maybe you can meet before work. You start at 8, why don't we meet at co for coffee at 7? We'll be fresh, we'll be awake, we'll be ready, we can talk about it. Unless you're not a morning person. Uh, but, you know, pick some place neutral and some place friendly to talk about it. Number three, I would say sympathize with their feelings. Sympathize. Use your ears more than your mouth. Philippians 2 says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. The Greek word here translated for uh, a look out for means to focus. I love that word. Focus. Focus first on their feelings, not on the facts. Because, you know, the facts are what the facts are and, and, and uh, none of that really matters because I'm upset. So focus on their feelings. Begin with sympathy not solutions. Guys are terrible at this. You know, guys just want to solve it. What can I do? You know, okay, I'll buy you a new one. Uh, what do I, I got to do? You know, uh, no, that, that's not the point. The point is that the person has emotions. They have feelings. Focus on those. Don't try to talk people out of how they feel. Oh, well, no, that's not really, that's not what I meant. That's not what you should think. That's, you know, don't, 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 don't go there. That's not, that's not your point. That's not your position. This is how they feel. So just listen and don't be defensive. Be sympathetic. Let them unload emotionally. I know that's hard. Ever done that? It's hard to just sit there and let somebody unload. It's hard to not say anything in defense. But, but just do it. Just be quiet. Nod your head. Nod your head. That doesn't mean you agree, right? That just means that you understand what they're saying. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I understand. Right? Not that I agree with you, but I understand. See, feelings aren't logical. That's, that's the tricky part. Feelings don't make sense. They're, they're, not, they're not true, even. You know? If, if the person actually had to write down why they feel this way, it would sound stupid. But they do. They feel that way. So if you try to address the issue too soon, you're going to just cause resentment. So first, just sympathize. You take the initiative, go to the sit down and just listen. Just try to be open to it. A uh, great saying says, um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And amen. You know, I don't, I don't really care how smart you are or how good you are or, or you know, how much, uh, how meaningful this is to you. Well, I'm only going to care about that if I know that you care about me. Number four, confess your part of the conflict. If you really want to restore the relationship, if you really want to reconcile a rift of something that's gone bad, you should begin by admitting your own mistakes and sins in the problem. And you know you have some. Matthew 7 says, You hypocrite, first take the, the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, I found that there's a really simple way to tell. It's really easy to tell when you've done something wrong in a, in a conflict. So you and your cousin aren't getting along, or you and this sister aren't getting along, and uh, you know how to tell when you've done something wrong? Usually predicated by times when you think, I don't know what I possibly could have done wrong to make them feel that way. Anytime you find yourself saying that, that's a key red flag, okay? Must be I've done something wrong, right? If you claim that you're free from sin, you're only fooling yourself. So find something. 
the way that you've acted. Look closely. You're going to find something. Consider actually asking a third party, someone you can trust, to honestly tell you the truth about what you've done. Not, not gossiping, not fishing for compliments, okay? but truthfully tell you what they think. See, confession is a, is a powerful tool for reconciliation. So if I come to you and I, and I sympathetically listen to what you have to say, and if the first thing out of my mouth is not defensive, but confessing, you know, the first thing out of my mouth is to tell you, yeah, I really shouldn't have acted this way, I shouldn't have done this. Often, how you handle the conflict causes a bigger hurt than the original problem. I mean, how many times have my wife and I got in an argument and when it gets really blown up, you know, like when you find yourself in the closet, you know, storming, you know, uh, um, and, you, and you stop from it and you ask yourself, or ask, better ask them, what was it we were fighting about? You know, because the, the fight has become so big that the actual issue is minuscule compared to it. And that's what happens if you don't address this properly. So, you know, go to them, be, be, uh, take the initiative to go to them, be sympathetic to them, and, and confess what you've done wrong. When you begin by humbly admitting your mistakes, it diffuses them. Their, 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 their anger just goes away. It, it, it dismisses and disarms them. They, they can't attack back because you just apologized. And what's the first thing they're going to say? Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm sorry too. So don't make excuses. Don't shift the blame. Come to them and honestly accept responsibility for your mistakes and ask for their forgiveness. When it comes to time to talk about the problem, there's an old Japanese saying I love that says, fix the problem, not the blame. Focus on fixing the problem. Don't focus on fixing the blame. Well, yeah, 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 but you were the first one that said this. You said this first. Oh, no, you said that first. Oh, really? No, it's rude. Well, I heard that from Judy. Well, Judy told me. And, you know, it just it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter who was, who's to blame. We have a problem. And the problem is there's a rift in our relationship. What are we going to do to reconcile our relationship? Proverbs 15 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I mean... Do you really want to stir up anger? Do you want to make things worse or better? In a conflict, how you say it is as important as what you say. I might be telling you the truth! But it doesn't matter if I yell at you. If you say it offensively, they're going to respond defensively. Never say anything that personally attacks the person. Hopefully you never do this. But don't, don't get personal with it. Say things like, well, you, what you have done is a sin. Instead of, well, you're a sinner. Don't, don't personally attack them. Just talk about the problem, not them. And number six, cooperate as much as possible. Peace always comes at a price. It's going to cost you something. Don't think you're just going to have a little discussion and resolve this. And for the sake of fellowship, pay whatever it costs. For the sake of fellowship, do whatever you can to cooperate. Adjust to others. Show preference to what they want. Give up your agenda. Give up your schedule to make them happy to restore the relationship. Now notice I, I said cooperate, not compromise. Nobody's, nobody's asking you to deny the fundamentals of your beliefs. But you are being asked to deny yourself that great feeling of being right. You don't deserve that. Christ died for this person. So just give up that. Give up that right of proving yourself right. You don't have to be right. Just reconciled. 
ask yourself if you really don't think it's it's if you don't really think it's that important of an issue if it honestly if you honestly don't think it's a it's a matter of fellowship then then why you're fighting over it it's probably just your personal preference it's probably just something that you feel comfortable with give up your comfort for the love and the sake of your brother and unity in your ecclesia if it really isn't that important give them the preference that they want and lastly i'll say emphasize reconciliation not resolution we're not going to be able to resolve this issue lots of times we're going to disagree it's unrealistic to expect everyone to agree about everything reconciliation focuses on the relationship resolution fo- focuses on the on the problem let's not focus on the problem let's just focus on the relationship i want to get back in a in a relationship with you a caring loving mutual engaged relationship interesting enough when you focus your attention on the problem it grows and grows and grows and grows if there's an issue that's uh, separating us and we start talking about our, our our beliefs and start getting into that the the more minutia we get into the deeper we we de- dive into it the farther apart we're going to be but if we focus on the relationship on on the love that we should have for each other that's going to grow and that's going to outweigh the other so focus on reconciliation the problem often becomes irrelevant or insignificant you can disagree with somebody without being disagreeable god expects unity not uniformity and that's i think one of the biggest problems is we think that everyone in our ecclesia should be the same and frankly that is like me and if people are not the same if there's not uniformity i don't feel comfortable i don't feel right I don't I don't like the way they do that. That's different than the way I do it. Different way that my mom and dad taught me. Different from the the way I brought up I was brought up from my ecclesia when I was in you know back home. Got to remember that God chose all these different members of your ecclesia for a reason. And he put them there for a reason. You're not going to agree on everything. That doesn't mean that you give up looking for a solution to your issues. Reconciliation means burying the hatchet, not burying the problem. You know, we we still talk about this, but let's talk about this lovingly. Let's make sure our relationship doesn't suffer. You don't have to resolve the issue, you just have to resolve the relationship. That's not easy work. I'll give you that. You have to work hard at peace in your ecclesia. But you do it for a simple reason because it's your job. It's your job to protect the unity of your ecclesia. Unity ecclesia is so important and in the New Testament gives a large portion of its focus to this concept of unity. Unity is the soul of fellowship. Destroy unity and you destroy the body. Unity is the essence of how God intends for us to experience life together. Life is all about love. God wants us to love one another, to live together in unity. So it's our responsibility to preserve unity. I want to talk a few minutes about preserving unity and some suggestions. First thing, focus on what you have in common, not on the differences. We have a lot in common. Let's focus on that. Let's not focus on the minute little things we differ on. First principles, for example, the first principles are essential. How many are there? There's only about 14 or 15. Really? If you write them all down and list them out, it's only about 14 or 15 things that really are important that we agree on. But there's thousands of of personal preferences. There's thousands of little rabbit holes we can go down to to define what I really think and my ideas. But is that really an essential thing? I like the first five words of the Bible as a as a perfect example. In the beginning, God created. I think God created is a pretty important point. I think we all have to agree that we didn't evolve here that God created everything we see and he created us. The next three the first three words though in the beginning well when was that? 
If you think it's 6,000 years ago, and I think it's 60,000, and someone else thinks it's 60 million, I think that can be a personal preference. As long as we all agree that God created us. And let's not focus on the things that we differ on. Let's not make every Bible class be about, well, we're going to do Bible class on Genesis 1 this year uh, uh, again, and we're going to look at verse 1, and I'm going to prove to you all that it's 6,000 years ago the earth was created. You're just going to cause rift. Let's focus on the things that we agree on. It might be a first principle, but uh, it might be a first principle that that, uh, God created the earth and mankind didn't evolve, but uh, is it really a first principle that this happened exactly, you know, 6,000 years ago? Focus on the good things. Focus on the things that build up. The things that encourage. Don't get caught in the cycle of of hashing over the tiny little unique and rather obscure points that, that we differ on. Look at the big picture. God chose different personalities. He chose different backgrounds. He chose different races. Your ecclesia now has people from different countries. People who didn't speak English in, in their, in, as their original language. So we need to learn to, to value and enjoy all the different people in the meeting. Not find a way to mash them all together into some kind of you know, uniformity. That's not what unity is about. When they, when they built the temple, they used all these different size rocks. When, when, the, when, the, when the Egyptians built... They made bricks exactly the same size. They just mashed up all this stuff and put them in a brick and and burned them and made them all the exact same size. That's not how God builds. God takes a rock that's 30 feet long, puts it right next to a little tiny one that just fits in that hole, just perfect. That's how your ecclesia is. Not everyone is going to be uniform. Not everyone is going to believe the same way or see things the same way or think all the same things are as important. We're going to have all different feelings. Just learn to live with that. Focus on the things you have in common. None of the things you have that are separate or different. We don't, have to, we don't all have to think alike to be in unity. Corinthians says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so there may be no divisions among you, may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Number two, be realistic. Now, this morning we painted a pretty uh, beautiful picture of, of real fellowship. It's easy to get discouraged when you start comparing that to what you experienced last Sunday. But you have to passionately love your ecclesia in spite of its imperfections. There's a a thing that I like to try to make sure we understand. Longing for the ideal while criticizing the real is immature. If you, if you spend your life thinking, oh, you know, ecclesia could be so much better, my ecclesia stinks, that's just, that's just immature. If you settle for the real without striving for the ideal, that's just complacency. Oh, yeah, my ecclesia's good enough, you know. We don't need to work about it, we don't need to improve it, do any changes. And maturity is this whole thing about living with the tension between the two, you know, what we could be and what we are. I don't want to be discouraged with what we are, but I don't want to accept what we are either. I want to try to encourage people and motivate people and push people and have us all grow and be better without getting discouraged about where we are now. The fact of the matter is, your brothers and sisters are going to disappoint you. They are going to let you down. But there's no reason to stop fellowshipping with them. No ecclesia is perfect. That, that's the whole point. That's why God put us in ecclesias, because they're not perfect. And he wants to see how we deal with that. Number three, uh, choose to encourage rather than criticize. It's easier to criticize than it is to get involved. Don't allow yourself to do that. It's not, it's not your job to criticize. Romans uh, 14 says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Uh, yeah, Romans 14 keeps on going. Roman verse 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him. In verse 10. You then, why do you judge your brother? Why do you look down on your brother? We all stand before God's judgment seat. 
Verse 13, let us therefore stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. In verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So say things that, that build up. Say things that are encouraging. Things that are positive, not tear down. Don't be, don't be, you know, oh, what is it, Betty? Oh, Debbie Downer. There it is. I knew it was a woman. Yeah. Uh, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't. sorry. Uh, I wasn't, wasn't Danny, Danny Downer. Don't, you know, don't, don't be the person that's just all negative. It's like, oh yeah, there was another example. Because if you're looking for examples, you're going to find lots of examples in your ecclesia about things that aren't going well. That's not the point. Say things that are positive. Either help out or keep out. Uh, refuse to listen to gossip. Gossip is simply passing on information that you are neither part of the problem or part of the solution. Everyone knows it's wrong to gossip and hopefully you don't do it. What I want to do today is I want to encourage you not to even allow yourself to listen to gossip. You've been thinking you've been doing pretty good by not speaking gossip. I'm telling you, don't even listen to gossip. Be the one who takes that awkward step and says, well, I don't think we really should be talking about this. And the conversation, you know, pauses. The fastest way to end a conflict is to lovingly confront the people who are gossiping. Ask them to stop. Hey, I don't, think we should, I don't think you should be saying that. I love this verse in Proverbs. It says, Without wood, a fire goes out, and without gossip, a quarrel dies down. Wow. And that's the truth. Number five, practice Matthew 18. You all know what it is. You've read it plenty of times. It's easier to complain to a third party than it is to courageously speak the love Speak the truth in love to the person you're upset with. It isn't right to complain. Matthew 18 says quite clearly, go and talk directly to that person that you have a problem with. I'm going to throw out some numbers here. You can disagree later, but you can't disagree now, uh, which is the beauty of uh, having the podium. Um, <laughs> if you talk directly to the person about the problem, I would say probably about 85% of the time, issue gets resolved. Ends right there. Just done. So now only about 15% remain it needs to be dealt with. So these last 15%, you take an unbiased third party with you, and the two of you go, and you talk to that person. And I bet about 85% of those get resolved. So now you just got 15% of the 15% that remains. Hold an ecclesial meeting with, with the whole ecclesia and that person, and probably about 85% of those are going to get resolved. It, it's God's method for conflict resolution. We know it. Sometimes we just get carried away and we forget it. Practice Matthew 18. Go to the person first. Talk to them. If that doesn't work, bring somebody with you. If that doesn't work, then get the ecclesia involved. Don't just start walking around the ecclesia on Sunday morning after meeting and say, did you notice that she's wearing pants? What do you know about pants? What do you feel about her wearing pants? This isn't really right. What about pants? I don't think she had a head covered. Did you have a head covered? I don't know. It's ever head covered, right? You know, you know that's, that's not what it's about. Go to the person and say, can we talk? You know, can you explain to me what, what you're thinking? What's going on? Number six, support your leaders. Uh, that's why you have them. You know, the arranging board isn't our invention. God thought this was the best way to run an ecclesia. He wanted to have leadership, roles of leadership in the ecclesia. Now, there are no perfect leaders, but God in his perfection arraigned our ecclesias to have leaders. God gives them the responsibility and the authority of maintaining unity in the ecclesia. Hebrews 13 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their, uh, their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that the work will be a joy not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Wouldn't it be great if being an arranging brother was a joy and not a burden? But look, here's the reason why. It's not going to be an advantage to you if you undermine them, 
There's no advantage to you if they're not able to do their job successfully and, and, and well. It's going to be an advantage to you and to the entire ecclesia if you obey them. Give them the authority that God has given them. Support them in their decision making. Encourage them. Honor them. They are imperfect leaders working with imperfect members in an imperfect world. Can you think of a harder job than that? 1 Corinthians 5 says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. And you might be thinking, well, not my arranging board. He doesn't know about my arranging board. Those guys are they are out of tune with the ecclesia. It's your arranging board. It's your ecclesia. If you want to start turning things around, you've got to start loving and respecting these people. God blesses ecclesias that are unified. It's in your ecclesia that we learn how to fellowship. We learn to love one another. Because learning how to love... Each other is what life is all about. We talked about a lot of things today. We talked about uh, prayer and Bible reading and fellowship and how we need to find ways in our ecclesia to make prayer active and common. Something that, that, is, that it goes on just as, just as much as coffee does. To make Bible reading frequent and, and applicable to what's going on in our lives. To make fellowship real in, in small groups. We talked about how real fellowship needs to be encouraged. It's our job to help it to grow. How we can cultivate that sense of community in your ecclesia. We talked about committing ourselves to these things like authenticity, having a genuine heart-to-heart -heart sharing with each other, mutuality, having equal concern for each other's problems instead of just being self-centered, sympathy, sharing in the pain of each other's instead of ignoring Mercy is when we rub mistakes out instead of rubbing them in. And honesty, when we lovingly speak the truth instead of glossing over the problems. Humility is admitting our own shortcomings instead of pretending that we're perfect. Courtesy is when we respect other people's differences instead of being irritated by their differences. Confidentiality is when we keep things private instead of gossiping about them. And frequency is when we're in the habit of getting together instead of scheduling other things instead. We talked about how fellowship sometimes falls apart. But because relationships are worth saving, we talked about how to restore a relationship, to pray before, take the initiative, be sympathetic, to confess your part of the problem, attack the problem, not the person, cooperate as much as possible, focus on, on reconciliation, not resolution. We'll be known by our love for one another. That's how you're known, by your love for each other. So unity in our ecclesia is vital to our health and is vital to our future. It's your responsibility to preserve the unity in your ecclesia. And that's the list we just went over. Focus on common things, not, not the things we have in difference. Be realistic and encouraging people, not gossiping. Following Matthew 18 and supporting our leaders. It's a long list of things that we talked about today. I, I appreciate your attention. I appreciate your giving me uh, the uh, uh, encouragement to speak openly and speak freely. My prayer, as we close, is that you'll find some of these thoughts helpful when you return home to your ecclesia. You'll be able to find a way to be helpful to those who face challenges to their faith. And that God will bless us with ecclesias that are healthy and vibrant and alive there are places where brothers and sisters and young people and even our visitors who walk in off the street can feel the love of Christ. For it's by our love for one another that we will be known. Because life is all about learning how to love one another. Let's close.